cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, so we're back at it again with a 2025 recap of everything you need to know about MOTC. What it is, how it works, the extent to which it's been looked at in humans. For some of the long-standing peptide hobbyists here, you'll remember I covered it a long time back. I think it was actually my first subscriber requested video back in the day, but also as you can tell, at that point in the channel's history, I was recording through a potato with some wires sticking out of it and my thumbnails were PowerPoint slides. And so now, you and I alike deserve a redo. So when we hear about MOTC, there's a lot of buzzwords floating around. Exercise mimetic, insulin sensitivity, metabolic improvement. In general, mitochondrial health has gained itself a growing body of interest because at the core of it lies this notion that mitochondrial dysfunction is characteristic of diseases of aging. Thus, by improving mitochondrial function at the cellular organelle level, we can perhaps offset different factors that contribute to aging and age-related disease. Mitochondria in particular, despite their proposed prehistoric existence, are becoming growingly popular organelles of interest nowadays. But let's go back in time and briefly cover what's known as the endosymbiotic theory. Mitochondria have their own distinct DNA, separate from the cell's nucleus, and scientists think this uniqueness traces back to an ancient partnership. The endosymbiotic theory proposes that mitochondria evolved from bacteria, specifically a group called alpha proteobacteria. Now roughly 1.2 billion years ago, but who's counting, a primitive host cell engulfed one of these bacteria. Instead of destroying it, the two formed a mutually beneficial alliance. The bacterium provided energy more efficiently, while the host offered shelter and resources. Over millennia, the bacterium became the mitochondria we see today, supercharging cellular energy energy production and paving the way for complex life. Point being, this event wasn't just important, it was foundational. It marked the rise of the first eukaryotic cells, which gave way to all plants, animals, and humans. Mitochondria weren't just added on mods, they were the upgrade that made complex life possible. Now, we call this peptide MOTC because it's much easier than saying the full name, but I'll try my best anyway. Mitochondrial open reading frame of the 12S RNA-C. Since it was discovered, the 16 amino acid peptide's been the subject of a good amount of preclinical research with growing interest in its potential in serving a range of metabolic, cardiovascular, inflammatory, and age-related diseases, among many more. And it's one of a series of peptides you'll see in the literature labeled as an MDP for mitochondrial-derived peptide. For instance, another peptide within this class is one we've discussed at length before called Humanin, and I'll make sure to link that video as well as all pertinent references used to make this one in the description below. Since it's discovery, MOTC has been found to be pretty universally present among different tissue types, but with a particular predominance in skeletal muscle, which could theoretically have implications that go beyond exercise endurance, such as glucose regulation via the metabolic effects of muscle tissue itself. Hence, in some preclinical animal models, the peptide appeared to have effects in not only protecting against obesity induced via diet, but it's also shown protective features against insulin resistance. And it appears MOTC serves as a signal that promotes glucose reuptake in skeletal muscle. Amidst the peptide's interactions with different signaling pathways, the GLUT4 glucose receptor is triggered to translocate to the plasma membrane, where it's ready to accept glucose and promote its metabolism. Now, you might be reminded of our recent video on longevity compounds like metformin, rapamycin, and spermidine because MOTC, like these compounds, addresses AMPK. Within the body, there's a process called de novo purine synthesis, which describes the intricate creation of new nucleotides, the building blocks of genetic material like DNA and RNA. The cycle relies strongly on folate. MOTC puts a hot on the folate cycle, thereby causing an uptick in the production of what's known as ACAR which serves as an AMPK activator. And as we discussed before, AMPK is, simply put, a regulator of energy homeostasis, with close ties to cellular metabolism, autophagy, and mitochondrial function. And like many compounds we discussed that are evaluated in the context of aging, what we notice about MOTC, its endogenous production, is that it also declines as we age. And although a bit speculative at this point, the optimistic idea is that aging reduces MOTC and therefore 
its administration could serve as an anti-aging tool. I know Mott sees a hot topic right now, and I feel the best use of our time would be to evaluate the clinical development of this peptide. How far has it gotten in clinical trials? What have human populations shown? Is it safe and effective? But before we address these questions, I'm going to request that if you haven't already to hit that like and subscribe. It goes a long way, and according to my YouTube statistics, a small percentage of viewers are actually subscribed to the channel, and it's undoubtedly the best way to help a peptide buddy out. Appreciate you. So first, bioavailability. It's the reason why MOTC is only really effective via some sort of injectable route. Oral administration is generally speaking a no-go because of poor gastrointestinal bioavailability. That said, there's true a limited amount of data on human pharmacokinetics, and thus it's a necessary indication for further research that clinical use would in part rely on. Now I will highlight some of the optimistic findings of preclinical research. We mentioned protection against diet-induced obesity and weight gain, there's improvement in metabolic factors, decreased adiposity, and there also appears to be antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects, cardioprotective capacity, possible implications in inflammatory bowel conditions, and perhaps even protective effects against muscle atrophy, particularly in immobilized rodent models. So many optimistic target points, and you can see why the human optimization slash human guinea pig communities are hyping the peptide up at this point in its research. But let's address the question, how much has MOTC been evaluated in humans? And this is an easy question to answer because the correct response is nada. There's been no published clinical trial of any status in humans at this point with regards to administration of exogenous MOTC. The only evaluations we've gotten in human subjects try to look at the correlation between endogenous MOTC levels and features of chronic disease. By this I mean MOTC has been measured in humans, but it hasn't been administered. For instance, there seems to be a correlation between reduced MOTC levels and coronary endothelial dysfunction in humans. Moreover, MOTC levels were found to be lower in those with type 2 diabetes versus healthy controls, and values of MOTC in this patient population look to be inversely correlated with HbA1c and glucose, similar to what we see with age. One interesting randomized controlled trial in humans looked at MOTC levels in HER2-positive breast cancer patients treated with metformin as well, and the idea here was to see how endogenous MOTC levels would react to metformin, because mechanistically there are features between the two drugs that overlap. Metformin not only helps to regulate glucose levels by modulating the effects of insulin, but it also activates AMPK as well. So the idea here was to see if metformin can be used to influence MOTC levels within the body, which it didn't appear to do. The levels of endogenous MOTC were virtually unchanged. Something like this could be helpful because pending the results, we could learn more about how metformin works or if MOTC could even be used as a biomarker one day. The results, as the researchers emphasized, were possibly due to metformin's limited impact on skeletal muscle, but further research will tell. And although MOTC shows protective effects towards lung injury in preclinical models, from a clinical standpoint, all we've got at this point is that MOTC levels are lower in people with chronic pulmonary conditions like COPD. And regarding the exercise mimetic claim, which we'll touch on later, it's worth noting that exercise in humans does appear to increase circulating MOTC levels, at least in the subset studied. Where's that leave us? We're stuck with a collection of interesting and promising preclinical data with clinical evaluation in its infancy. We don't even have the most basic studies in humans to assess pharmacokinetics, dose finding, and short-term safety, not to mention long-term risks and benefits. MOTC, in my eyes, is one of the most promising peptides out there, and it fascinates me immensely. But although unsurprising, I'm tempted to say it's borderline shocking people are recommending its consumption when we don't have the most rudimentary of understandings of how exogenous administration would interact with human physiology. And since most of my subscribers are humans, or so I'm led to believe, I hope you found this review of the compound helpful. MOTC is popularly thought of as an exercise mimetic, colloquially called exercise in a pill. Perhaps one day research will paint this peptide as such, but currently it's not where we're at given the observational nature of human research and the fact that none has been administered to humans in a clinical setting. While preclinical studies and animal models demonstrate that exogenous MOTC administration can capture some metabolic and functional benefits of exercise, and while human studies show that endogenous MOTC levels increase in response to acute and chronic exercise, there have been no published clinical trials administering exogenous MOTC to humans to test for exercise reproducing effects. 
And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts though, so make sure to leave a comment, and if you're looking for a further way to support the channel, I'll let you know about a couple opportunities to do so. First, we've got the Patreon, where subscribers request a lot of content that finds its way either there or to the main channel. I've also got a 20-page educational guide on PPC-157 and a Peptide Codex online catalog with comprehensive descriptions of different peptides that's updated on a regular basis. The links to all of these will be in the description below, but most importantly, I want to thank you for the time it took to watch this video. I hope you have a great day, and you take care. I'll see ya. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.